What did the Gamecocks have to do tomorrow to beat LSU? I think the first thing is they've got to be productive on offense, which has been a little bit of a struggle. I know they hit some, hit some plays late against Kentucky. But I think when you have caliber of quarterback that LSU does, even as good as South Carolina's defense has been, as good as they've been rushing the passer off the edge, you're going to have to put up some points. I don't think they can expect to win this game, you know, 20 to 16. So productivity on the offense would be the first thing I would think of. Continue to create turnovers and then not give any away. You can't give them short fields. I think that would be the biggest thing. Speaking of that, Lenora Sellers said after this first game that he was timid, he was nervous. How did you like his adjustment in week two against Kentucky? I thought as the game went on, he got better and better, right? And he made big plays late through a couple touchdown passes, uh, had some explosive plays in the passing game off a, off a triple option look that Nick Saban's going to break down in the film room um, tomorrow on college game day. So um, I think, you know, obviously he's, he's a talented young guy who just needs experience. I mean, it's kind of human for him to be – you know, feeling his way a little bit early on in the season. I think he'll get better and better as they go along, and it certainly helps if the defense plays as well as it has to give him a little bit of margin for error. What do you think about South Carolina's pass rush? They got 10 sacks in two games and uh, only had like 20, 21 last year. I was uh, I was just talking to Clayton White a few minutes ago. He stopped by to say hello. And I mean, we've got a young one and a veteran one on each side. Both of them have been meeting at the quarterback, and I think that um, – you know, Dylan Stewart is a rising star in this in this game. He's going to be a guy who continues to grow there. To, talking to Clayton, there's just a lot of things that he does naturally. He sort of knows how to do it, and he's learning some of the techniques and when he has to be disciplined to stay outside because of a defensive call or when he has a little more freedom, uh, you know, maybe to just beat his guy. Those types of things. But, boy, you want to start – uh, with the level of intensity and the level of ability that he has. And, and, you know, talking to him, I haven't had a chance to meet Dylan yet, but from talking to the coach, he, um, he sounds like a great young man who really just soaks it all up, easy to coach, and I think the future's right for him. And then having a guy like Kennard on the other side, um, you know, who's, who's been through some things and, you know, has played a lot of ball. And, you know, just an opportunity to, for those two to work together. And it's worked out very well for them so far. Their pressure numbers, in addition to sacks, just pressure percentage on dropbacks is really high. Uh, the forced fumbles, you know, really high. You put the ball on the ground, it's great if you recover it. Even if you don't, you've created a disadvantage for the offense. So uh, they've done a lot of really, really good things on defense in the early going, and a large part of it is because of those two defensive ends. And certainly even worry has been great in the back as well. Bruce, I heard your podcast explaining why you ended up coming here for College Game Day yeah. today. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Preseason, did you have this game circled think you'd be here? Yeah. And, what, and what are you expecting from it? No, I didn't. Not at all. I mean, I would love to say, that, oh, yeah, we're always keeping things on the radar. But not really because Georgia, Kentucky seemed like a natural because – don't mean this disrespectfully to South Carolina. I know that South Carolina's had Kentucky's number. But – for the home game in Kentucky, you've got the two Georgia transfers who are prominent, you know, Brock Vandegrift and Javon Dumas Johnson from each side of the ball from Kentucky. A lot of storylines there. That seemed to be the play. And then with South Carolina, with the way they performed last week, it, it changed it. And that's the great thing about this show is that we try to go with the best story every week. We try to, you know, if a team loses a game, doesn't mean we can't go there. But sometimes it does alter – uh, the story, the trajectory of the season. So we try to be try to be flexible and be ready to go anywhere where the story takes us. So this is a good one. It's also fun that it's noon um, and being able to move inside the stadium and sort of let people experience what that's like in the in the moments leading up to the game. The way this rise, which it, most people have seen it, most people are familiar with it, but hopefully we can you know we can give it a great feel on game day. So do you think Coach Beamer is going to help South Carolina be more consistent in the SEC? Oh, I think so. I mean, Shane's a, a dynamic guy, uh, easy to root for, easy to like, certainly knows ball inside out. He's worked with, with great people, and obviously he's proven to be able to get talent to come to South Carolina. I think that, you know, this has been historically a place that has had moments of good, but very few moments of great. And, you have, and you're talking to a guy who's you know, very close to 
uh, a couple of your former head coaches do something. You know, I'm going to tell you, if you go to the University of South Carolina and, you know, every whip, I don't know, whip, this game talks to you. You know, so, I mean, you've had some legends here, but it, it takes um, it takes some persistence for whatever reason to maintain a level, and I think Shane is well put to do that. And then you have the athletic director announcing today that he's going to be stepping down. How do you feel about that as far as the program? Well, he's, he's a legend here, obviously, for the championships that he won in baseball and for the leadership he's given. Um, I've already had some people, I won't, I won't give you any names, but a couple people reach out to me, hey, what do you know about that? I'd like to have that job. You know, so yeah. it's a it's an attractive job in athletic circles, for sure. And I, I'm sure they'll hire a, a guy who will lead them well into the, into the next chapter. Don Staley going to join you guys on the show tomorrow. How she is. How you uh, have Don on the set? Well, I'm very excited. And I'll tell you, you know, I don't try, I try to, I don't try, I do remain neutral all the time. And Don. I'm sure Dawn remembers this. Years ago, when she was at Temple and still coaching Temple and playing, um, the late Mal Moore, who hired Nick at Alabama as a coach, Mal calls me up, and, he, and I was covering women's uh, women's championship at the time. And he said, "Look, I don't know a lot of you know a lot of coaches, you know, in women's game. Who should I look at?" And uh, I said, "You should try to hire Dawn Staley." And he did. He tried very hard. I think what I don't know all of the details. I think most of it centered around Don still wanted to play and coach for a little while. And in the SEC, you know, they didn't feel like that was right. Maybe there were other factors too. But uh, I've been an admirer of hers as a coach and as a player for a long time. So we're really, really excited to have her out there. She'll be great. What do you think more likely she wear a South Carolina gear or some sort of Philly gear? <laughs> she might mix. I mean, she might go a little Gamecock, a little Eagle. You know, she could do a little bit of both for sure. Okay. There's been a lot of talk this week about LSU's O-line versus South Carolina's D-line. But on the other side of that, what does it want USC's O-line need to do against a very talented and experienced LSU defense? Well, they're experienced, but they're learning a new system. And I think one of the things that I noticed when I called LSU's game against a USC was that they were able to – Create some more havoc plays, and that's sort of a staple of a Blake Baker defense. But I think they're still growing into that. They're still figuring out exactly how they want to use Harold Perkins. You know, whether he's going to be dropping in coverage more, which he has a little bit more this year. They're going to use him as a pass rusher. You know, they've had an injury on the defensive front right now. So I, I think it's a it's a big deal because the whole philosophy behind Blake Baker's defense, the new defensive coordinator, which I know you guys are familiar with from this time in Missouri. Um, is to create negative plays. So it'll be as, as much as that's a big time matchup with those rush ins that we talked about and those two first round tackles that LSU has, uh, that will be important too. Because as I said earlier, South Carolina is going to have to move the ball some. They're going to have to be productive on offense. And in order to do so, obviously, they have to have to control LSU's front. And then if after someone, 10 years, you're back here in South Carolina. What are you hoping for the fans tomorrow? What do you hope they bring? Well, I, just a lot of energy, big numbers. A lot of intensity, responsiveness to the show, which I'm sure they will. And we'll try to put on a great show for them. I mean, we're even going to have some uh, some musical numbers for them. So we'll we'll try to keep them entertained during commercial breaks, and then certainly during the show, we'll be entertained as well. If someone asked you about the positives and the negatives of being an athletics director here at USC, what would you tell them? I mean, the positives that you're in the SEC and you have a you have a revenue stream that you know is going to continue. That's the number one thing. Um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm familiar with where you guys are with your, not you guys, you guys are drunk, it's where South Carolina is with its collective and with you know, their ability to recruit, which is a big factor. Have to have that until something else, you know, something else changes. You're going to have to be in the game, you know, in terms of, um, you know, providing NIL opportunities for the players. All legal, you know, all legal. So if they have that in line, I can't find too many negatives. Now, um, the history that I mentioned earlier, the lack of consistency at the highest level, if the athletic director can either identify why that is or identify the fact that this is a program that we expect to be consistently good, occasionally great, there's nothing wrong with that. I know that's going to sound like a put down. I don't, it's not. I mean, that's almost every program, you know? And so getting to that, 
if they can identify the reasons for the lack of consistency at times over the years, I think would be uh, would probably be the only negative I can think of. I can't really think of any negatives. I mean, it's a good place to live. You've got unbelievable support. I mean, the number of times that this place has been filled when the team hasn't really had anything to play for in terms of championships, but they've had a lot to play for in terms of pride in the program, in terms of um, in, in terms of being respectful of the support they've gotten, have a ton to play for there, and that's been a good reciprocal relationship between the fans and the players. So that's not like that ever. So I think that's something that would be very attractive to any athletic player. We see much of this in your game notes. Has any team ever lost to USC twice in three weeks? Um, you're not, you are not getting me with, with this because some of, some of the people have gotten mad at me before for the other one because I'm an honest man, and I, I love it here in Columbia. I went to Hall's Chop House last night, one of the best men's ever had in my life. The people here are so nice. Unbelievable support. When I hear the word Carolina, I think of my friend Hubert Davis and the Tar Heels. I just do, you know. And uh, so I, you know, I hear USC, and I think the other one. Now the opportunity is for the crowd to change that. Make me think of cocky 2001 sandstorm, the chicken curses. You know, like Steve Tannehill, my friend George Rogers. Make me think of that when I hear USC. Make me think of that when I hear Carolina. Because right now, I gotta admit, I, I'm not there yet. But they can change it tomorrow morning. They can change it tomorrow morning. To answer your question, I, I doubt it, but I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know if they've gotten, if both USC's uh, have, have gotten anybody in the span of three weeks. Thank you. Okay, nice political answer. Yeah, yeah. is that it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, but you're in Columbia now, so. Well, I know what, I got, yeah. I got, well, I'll tell you what really, got them mad back when I did games and play by play and I had to my producer helped me break the habit because I grew up in North Alabama and when you said tech that's mm -hmm. Georgia Tech or Virginia Tech first football game I ever saw first college football game I ever saw um, Virginia Tech played in it and they lost to Alabama 77 to 6 and on the mm -hmm. scoreboard it didn't even say Virginia Tech it said VPI so tech wasn't them tech was Georgia Tech so I called a Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech game on a Thursday night, and I would just instinctively in my mind, you know, Tech, you know, <laughs> Tech picked up 12 on the play. I, that's Georgia Tech to me, you know. So uh, you can things can change. It changed that night over the course of the game. The Carolina versus North Carolina, the Carol, the USC versus USC. That can change Saturday morning. All right. Thank you. And after that, elect me, vote for me for whatever it is I'm running for. All right, guys.